Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Dan Rundy, and I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. I also lead the Americas program. Thank you for joining us today for a conversation on building economic opportunity in Central America and the Caribbean. Before we formally begin, let's take care of some logistics. This event will last approximately 60 minutes. This event will include keynote remarks, remarks from each of our panelists, and a moderated discussion. Following the moderated discussion, we will field questions from the audience. We ask our audience to submit questions by clicking on the Ask Live Questions button on the event webpage. Please note that this live stream discussion will be recorded and made available on the event webpage immediately after the conclusion of this event. Again, good morning. We're very grateful to Heifer International for supporting this event. Heifer is committed to supporting development initiatives throughout Central America and the Caribbean, and we're honored to count them as one of our partners for our continued work on ensuring economic success in the region. This event is a culmination of a broader project on the topic of building economic opportunity in the region. We're especially proud to share with you our latest report authored by my colleague Connor Savoy entitled Economic Opportunity in the Northern Triangle. It can be found on our webpage as well as linked to the event website. This event will touch upon many of the topics brought up in the report and discuss economic opportunities for Central America and the Caribbean. Here are some highlights. There's lack of economic opportunity in Central America and the Caribbean, and it's a major driver for irregular migration. The COVID-19 pandemic has further exacerbated these conditions. Moving forward, it is essential to consider how to best support these central drivers of development and how multilateral financial inst institutions can play an important role in sharing risk and helping crowd in private capital. Expanding sustainable livelihood opportunities in the region is important to helping the countries of the region address the drivers of irregular migration long term and provide sustainable employment opportunities. During our conversation today, we will discuss the potential impact of investments in micro, small and medium enterprises and cooperatives on economic opportunity in Central America and the Caribbean. MSMEs reportedly represent 99% of business in of businesses in Latin America and the Caribbean and 67% of employment, according to the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. MSMEs <coughs> face challenges which may impede their ability to be competitive on an international scale, such as inadequate financing, low productivity rates in comparison to more international operations, and have lack access to international markets. In the Northern Triangle countries of El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, MSMEs also face barriers to growth in the form of criminal extortion. Moving mm -hmm. forward, it'll be necessary to assist MSMEs in breaking down these barriers to reach their full economic potential. Our event today will be moderated by my friend and colleague, Ms. Christy Pilecchia. She's a senior associate with the CSIS Project on Prosperity and Development. She's also a principal at Pilecchia International an advisory firm focused on financial strategy, capital markets, policy, sustainability, and partnerships. She was also a former senior advisor for the Western Hemisphere at the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, the DFC, where she served as a key advisor to the agency's president and CEO to provide guidance and leadership on policy and transactional matters for the Western Hemisphere. Prior to joining, joining the DFC, Ms. Palekio worked at Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corporation and PN, BNP Paribas, focusing on the Americas. We're really grateful to have Ms. Palekia to moderate this discussion today. But before we turn to Ms. Palekia, I'd like to open the floor to Mr. Pierre Ferrari. Mr. Ferrari is the president and CEO of Heifer International, with over 40 years of business experience working for companies such as Coca-Cola USA, serving as chair and board member of Ben & Jerry's homemade ice cream. Mr. Ferrari chose to focus his expertise on international development and, and issues pertaining to, to social justice. At Heifer, 
Mr. Ferrari works with communities of smallholder farmers to transfer impoverished conditions into self-sustaining prosperity. We're so pleased that Mr. Ferrari that you're able to participate in this event. Mr. Ferrari, I'm turning the floor over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. I appreciate the support. And uh, I just want to call out, shout out the, the wonderful report that's been written by Connor. Uh, I think it really covers a lot of the issues. However, it does not cover all the issues, and I'm going to bring that up. Uh, Heifer works with a specific segment of impoverished people, the smallholder farmers, you well know. And this surfaces interesting opportunities and challenges. Just to be clear in, my, in the beginning of my conversation here, that our goal, Heifer's goal, is to support the development of pro-poor wealth creating value chains. Note in particular the pro-poor component is very much part of our focus. This metric about new value creation and its distribution is core to what we do. So how do we do that? And we've got experience all over the world, as you well know, not just in the Golden Triangle, but in Africa and Asia. And one component that I think is, un, is sufficient, insufficiently discussed is the importance of social capital. We have found that communities that have worked hard at understanding their conditions and overcoming the sort of hopelessness that permeates many of the, com many of the communities we work with, convert this hopelessness into hopefulness. This takes time and you're really overcoming generational poverty issues, including you know, uh, genocide, genocidic uh, kind of uh, situations as you find in Guatemala, et cetera. So this social psychology, we understand and uh, experience to be really important for the success of investment. Uh, I'll repeat that. This social psychology, a, a, a preparation to self-reliance and accountability is a necessary conditions for successful investment. We use a whole variety of techniques, which we don't have time to talk about, but without it, we find that uh, it, it's, it's just not successful. So our, our deal flow is always what we call inside out. It comes from the communities and the development of these pro-poor wealth creating value chains. One of the key components of creating value chains that indeed can be receptive to self-reliance and accountability and success for the communities to overcome poverty is there's two components to it. One is time. It takes time. And I think one of the flaws, and this is coming from a business background, one of the flaws of the development communities, I believe, is it's, it's too much in a hurry. You know, uh, you talk about the uh, USAID, DFID, and all sorts of other institutional donors. They have this cycle, three to five year cycle for project. We believe that's absurd. It needs to be a 10 to 15 year cycle, if not longer. It takes time to overcome generational poverty and generational conditions and systems, systems that exist that have actually exploited in either predatory ways or simply uh, have just collapsed into very poor value chain creation for the poor. So time is an element that is not talked about enough. It's, it's, it's mentioned a little bit in the CIS, CIS uh, report in terms of being uh, the patient capital and other components on how to deploy capital. Okay, but time is important. The other one is demand. We have found that there's far too little analysis and understanding of the demand for the goods that are gonna be sold by whatever company or co-op or organization that is going to be building and supporting the development of pro-poor wealth creating value chain. This requires analysis, requires uh, experience, etc. And in the, in the example that's provided in, uh, in, in Coromala, Nueva Corala, one of the components that is leading to a success is a deep understanding of the demand for, for, for spices that can be grown in Guatemala, be it cardamom or black pepper. Our relationship with McCormick, the big international spice company, is a substantial component of understanding that demand and participating with an experienced off, off taker such as McCormick. So social capital is important. The preparation of the community either through, through, through some kind of collective action through co-ops or other mechanisms, that's very important. If that's not existing, it will not happen. 
the creation of collective action then generates the opportunity for investment to be made because the collective, the co-op or other, will, will be the, the, the genesis and the embryonic basis for uh, SMEs. So our strategy is inside out, coming from the community out to the field, to the demand side. That is not the usual approach. Uh, I, I was on the board of directors of CIF for many, many years, and their particular approach, which can be successful, is actually an outside in. They're looking for companies that are developing cash positive, et cetera, in which they can make an investment. Heifer's model is reversed. We want to be inside out to benefit the, the communities. Um, the final point, I, the final point I want to make is 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 uh, not the not the final point. A repeat of the point I want to make is the importance of demand. It's understanding in detail whether it's going to be domestic demand or import substitution or export led, et cetera, et cetera, and and the systems by which that demand is accessed. That is that is not well understood by the communities. That is not well understood by investors, actually. And that kind of analysis is really required to be successful. And we have examples all over the world on where shoddy demand analysis has led to failure and where excellent or deeply understood demand analysis leads to success. And again, I would just reemphasize the whole issue of patience to change the systems that have oppressed and damage these communities for decades takes time. Dan, that's it. That's what I got to say. <laughs> All right, I, I'm, we're going to hand the floor over to my friend Christy. Christy, over to you. Thank you, Dan, and, and thank you so much, Pierre, for that fabulous keynote uh, and also for the event today. Um, so we have a really informed group of speakers here with diverse experience working on various aspects of economic opportunity in Central America and the Caribbean. Um, and so now I'd like to, to introduce them. So first we have Magdalena Coronel, who's the Chief Investment Officer for IDB Labs. Um, IDB Labs is the innovation or venture arm of IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, they are incredibly impressive. They are really one of a kind in that they they provide the venture funding for entrepreneurs. And I think anyone who's interacted with them or who's interacted with any entrepreneur in the region would be incredibly impressed by just the sheer volume of opportunities that they evaluate and that they ultimately um, you know, work with and, and fund. So hugely impressive and we really look forward to hearing your thoughts. We also have with us Jose Ordonez, who is not only the chief executive officer of Kingo Energy, but is also a managing director of CIF, the organization that Pierre mentioned. And Kingo Energy, so I, I first had the opportunity to, to meet Jose a few years ago in Guatemala, um, learned about Kingo. They provide prepaid solar energy and provide access to energy for people who don't have access to the grid. And it's just a phenomenal life-changing model. He has developed financing from a variety of strategic multilateral sources. So I, it's just impre so impressive what he's been able to do um, and how he's been able to fund it. And as well, he's a managing director at CIF, which is a very well-known impact fund throughout the, throughout the region. And then lastly, we have Alejandro Ortiz, who's a managing director for commercial banking at Banco Industrial, focused on SMEs. Um, he, Banco Industrial is the largest bank in Guatemala uh, with a 28% market share. Uh, back when I was working at the DFC, one of the things that really struck me about Banco Industrial was just how involved they were in providing SME financing, having received almost 500 million in financing from the US government that they then on lent to entrepreneurs. So with that, I will turn it over to Magdalena, who will introduce herself and some remarks. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to CSIAS and Chris in particular. So my name is Magdalena Coronel. I'm the Chief Investment Officer at the IDB Lab. The um, 
I DB Lab is the innovation laboratory of the Inter-American Development Bank. We exist with the idea that we need to find new ways to accelerate inclusion in Latin America and the Caribbean. After more than three decades working in the region, we have been able to work with 26 countries, more than 2,300 projects, more than 2 billion invested in the region, and working with more than 1,500 partners. Um, since the beginning of the year, we have developed a new vision for 2025, which actually emphasize in uh, promote social progress and strengthen governance and institutions, as well as uh, help to reactivate the, pro the productive sector in our region. And therefore, SMEs are extremely important. And SMEs are extremely important and kind of the backbone of the region in the sense of like, the level of employment that they generate, and this relates a lot with our topic today um, related to migrants. In particular, we have been working in support returning migrants to the region as well as um, financing and um, support technically um, SMEs in the region, and we can share a couple of examples, but I will pass it to Alejandro, I guess. I think it is Jose's turn. Um, first, <laughs> you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Magdalena. Um, well, uh, thanks uh, to um, CSIS for the invitation. Um, I, I've been uh, here at Banco Industrial for the last 25 years, and um, I'd like to start off by by saying a couple of things. Um, I have seen firsthand how. OPIC and IDB's support back in 2013 with uh, the first transaction that, that we did it w was it had a huge impact in the development of our low income uh, housing uh, financing. We, we've developed a very uh, you know large and, and a very very good, very sound, very healthy low income housing financing uh, portfolio. And then in, in 2020, we did a, a new transaction right in the middle of the pandemic. I think it, the, the execution of that, that transaction was just amazing. I think in about six weeks time, we were able to put together this financing, which was actually uh, very helpful. And if you followed how Guatemala has endured the pandemic since March 2020, when it when we had our first case here in Guatemala. And I, I think uh, there were a lot of things happened uh, uh, that allowed us to be one of the countries that was able to manage the crisis in a better way, so to say, in terms of uh, the, the, the decreasing of our GDP, uh, as well as the sanitary part of the uh, uh, of the pandemic where we've seen that we have lower levels in, in terms of contagions and, and COVID related deaths. But OPIC's help doing that so, so fast and, and so swiftly and so efficiently was definitely something that really helped uh, us uh, as a bank be able to deploy those funds to the final beneficiaries, uh, which were ultimately most of them SMEs. Uh, both uh, here in the capital city of Guatemala as well as in the little towns of, of Guatemala. Uh, and I can tell you that, that the other thing I wanted to tell you is that we at Banco Industrial have a very keen focus on uh, you know, expanding our SME portfolio as well as our micro business portfolio. And uh, in 2020, back in January, we, uh, you know, the, the bank's uh, corporate structure changed um, I, uh, you know, took the managing director position for uh, for uh, commercial banking, creating you know new new capacities in terms of the the, the teams that we have uh, to attend to to SMEs and and to micro businesses. And uh, the the some piece of good news is that as of uh, October of this year, so in two weeks' time we have hired uh, somebody to uh, assist us as vice president for entrepreneurship. So we are uh, in the process of building, and, and this was uh, authorized by our board of directors uh, a couple of months ago, and, and we've been putting together the team, but we're in the process of building a whole area that will take care to uh, assist and attend entrepreneurs in Guatemala. And, and as, as Jose knows, and, and, and many of you, uh, Magdalena, 
uh, that, that, that you work in the in the entrepreneur ecosystem uh, it, it is totally different the approach to, 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 to actually adequately attend these potential um, you know uh, entrepreneurs and potential uh, clients you, you have to think differently you cannot think as a commercial bank right so we we're, we're assembling a team of people that um, have been working in the entrepreneurship e ecosystem for the last 10 years and that they know the approach you know the the cap seed capital that you need uh, the, the the acceleration process that you need to go through all of the things related to to assisting them other than financing that they need a lot of training and they need a lot of of tools that uh, you know if you don't put them together with the financing uh, you're not going to be able to have a successful business right so we're in the process of building that we think that that is something that's going to have a, a very huge impact in in guatemala and i am very much looking forward to to learn a little bit more about what idb is doing in in terms of the entrepreneurship ecosystem because wh what we want to start doing is building alliances and you know strategic alliances with as soon as possible with every single institution that is involved in the entrepreneur ecosystem in Guatemala, you know, universities, uh, ONGs, uh, multilaterals, and start really doing something much more dramatic that will cause a visible impact in the short term in terms of financing entrepreneurs in Guatemala. So that's the news from here. Turn it over to Jose. Yeah, uh, thank you, Alejandro. So uh, good morning and uh, greetings also from, from Guatemala. So. We've all heard the very tragic and very real stories coming out of out of Guatemala about lack of education, uh, insecurity, corruption, uh, lack of adequate health care and education, uh, impact of climate change on smallholder farmers, and all of this leading to endemic poverty and illegal migration. Uh, so we've all heard that. But there's also a very different side to Guatemala that you probably haven't heard about. Um, I'm, I'm speaking to you from Cuatro Grados Norte, which is a district in Guatemala City, which is our answer to Silicon Valley, but uh, with a twist. Um, in this four block by four block district, we have close to 200 tech startups, um, many of them aiming to solve some very big problems in areas such as energy access, uh, healthcare, education, financial access and agriculture. Uh, one of them is Kingo Energy, the company that I that I lead. Um, so as Christy said, Kingo, uh, through its proprietary and uh, hardware and software technology, provides prepaid solar power to 25,000 off-grid families in Guatemala and Colombia. Um, we started out developing small 15-watt systems that could power three light bulbs uh, and charge a cell phone. Uh, today, several years later, we're developing technology to bring internet to off-grid communities in a fast and cost-effective way. Uh, we're also developing systems that can power uh, rural schools and enable the provision of remote education. Uh, we're developing productivity enhancement solutions for rural SMEs, such as bundles that include a fresh, efficient refrigerators or terminals that allow community convenience stores to sell cold beverages or become payment gateways for uh, banks. So, Really, Guatemala has most of the pieces in place uh, to, to solve a lot of our problems. Um, we have some great entrepreneurs who are close to the problem and therefore are very well suited to develop solutions. We have a unique ecosystem in the region. Uh, Cuatro Grados Norte is, uh, there's nothing like it from Mexico City to Medellin. Um, we have some very good tech universities that are, that are increasingly connecting to this ecosystem. Um, we have some great hardware and software developers that can hold their own against anybody in the world. And by the way, today you don't need to be in Silicon Valley to develop great technology. Uh, to develop hardware, all you need is a makerspace, and we have a few and very good ones. Uh, to develop software, of course, all you need is a laptop and, uh, and an internet connection. So in, in 2021, uh, technology development is fully decentralized. However, we, we do have some significant challenges. Uh, the main one is uh, lack of institutional equity capital formation. Um, there's a lot of money sitting in local family offices, but they're investing in the KKRs and Sequoia capitals of this world. They're not backing local tech startups uh, and certainly not uh, non-tech SMEs outside of Guatemala City. Um, 
So Kingo was a very unique case. Uh, our founders had a strong personal network uh, that allowed us to raise seed capital. Uh, in the end, it was the backing of a very visionary local family office that was already in the energy space that gave us some of the initial capital that we needed to scale. Now, several years later, we've raised uh, around $40 million and our cap table is pretty institutional. They include several DFIs uh, such as Proparco, FMO and IDB Invest. Uh, we have a couple of corporate VCs, including that of NG, uh, which is a leading French uh, multinational utility, and EPM, which is a leading Latin American regional utility, and some institutional private equity funds such as SEAF. Um, the, however, most, uh, most Guatemalan entrepreneurs don't have this network, particularly non-tech entrepreneurs that live outside of Guatemala City. Um, so this is really where the DFIs and particularly DFC can be catalytic uh, by providing anchor LP investments to local fund managers and providing de-risking mechanisms to crowd in local money and, and international institutional investors. Uh, the DFIs can, can unleash local entrepreneurship and, and economic opportunity. So thank you very much. And back to you, Christy. Okay, thank you very much, Jose. Um, so, so thank you all for that excellent introduction and overview of who you are and how you fit in. Um, I guess let's start with uh, Magdalena. You know, you talked about um, oh my gosh, twenty three hundred projects, fifteen hundred partners. I mean, to Pierre's point that these things take time, I can't even imagine <laughs> how much time you've spent on this. Um, can you talk about the types of projects that the IDB Labs finances in the Northern Triangle, and what kind of, you know, I think it's always interesting to understand from an entrepreneur's perspective what kind of hit rates do you see, right? So what are their chances of actually getting the financing? Um, and then, you know, where are the where are the opportunities that are getting missed? Um, and how can the US government, because, you know, the, in this excellent report that Connor put together, what, what they really want to understand is how the US government can support the economic opportunity in the Northern Triangle. And so where do you see the, the opportunities for the US government to get involved? Thank sure. You. Sure. Um, so from the IDB lab, we work with three different instruments. We work with technical corporations, um, debt, loans, and um, equity. So I, I can tell you a couple of examples of what we have been doing in each one of them and how to um, how, how we, we are seeing the work with the different entrepreneurs. From the technical corporations, we have been working in um, for sure, support returning migrants. And in particular, we have a program with uh, World Vision, creating opportunities for economic reinsertion in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. We have the first center of opportunities for young migrants, a project that we have been developing in Honduras to help develop quality education that will help these migrants uh, insert back into um, their their home country, as well as facilitating the data for um, public entities to be able to create public policy around migration. We also have been working in a project called um, Código for Better Life that actually works with uh, women, young people, and returning migrants in everything related to coding and also in the relationships with tech companies in the region so we have a better um, inclusion of, of these um, vulnerable populations. On the um, technical and financial support, we have been developing facilities related to microfinance to help SMEs in the region. We have um, a couple of like funds that actually reach or target different kind of populations within the region, as well as um, two big equity instruments or line of work. One is everything related to venture capital ecosystems. We believe that we need to keep um, developing the venture capital ecosystems in the North Triangle. We have been working with the family offices to create the culture to generate more fund managers, um, 
there has been a um, fantastic event a couple of months ago with a lot of participation of different family offices towards creating that culture. And on the other side, we are developing a line of direct equity investments into um, tech startups in, in these nascent ecosystems. And I'm happy to announce that a couple of weeks ago, we closed our first investment in um, Hugo Technologies, a company in El Salvador is a food um, delivery technology and ride hailing service. It's a fantastic company that has been working in seven countries in Central America and the Caribbean. Three young um, El Salvadorians um, entrepreneurs uh, actually generating this fantastic endeavor that has been growing exponentially. And what we are trying to do there is actually creating, and I think Jose was talking this, was touching this point, is creating the role model to attract investment from outside the region into um, Central America and the Caribbean. In particular, we have been in conversations with the FC to actually um, share our pipeline of deal flow, understanding the needs of these um, early stage startups to create more venture capital investments um, within the North Triangle. We also develop a Better Together Challenge where we were looking for innovative solutions to the approach of migrant. It was a very successful challenge and we are developing a new one uh, with the help of US I aid. So these are the different lines of work that we have been developing through the North Triangle in particular in the last couple of months. Thank you. And just a, just a couple of follow ups. How do you decide which projects, you know, what are the criteria for the projects that get funded and that don't? And then when you talk about the projects, you mentioned some of the technical and, and the better together challenge for the migrants. Are those aid or is that an actual investment from IDB labs? So basically, we work with the different instruments in these challenges. It's te um, technical cooperation as well as loans, and it depends on the um, needs of the different like projects, which instrument we use. The different stages of a company developing development actually calls for different solutions. So in some case, might be technical cooperation. In other case, might be loans or um, direct equity investments. Um, with regards to what are the requirements, it depends also on the product. We, what we look at is that the requirements that we have across the different instruments is that we want to work with um, tech-based solutions um, that actually solves the gaps related to um, social inclusion, gender diversity, and climate change within, um, within the region. Um, in particularly, what we work is we try to actually collaborate with between the different uh, instruments. Therefore, if a startup might not be the right profile for direct equity, it might be a good profile for loans or technical cooperation. But the minimum is um, a tech-based tech solution that can support to close the gap regarding to social inclusion, gender diversity, and, and climate change. Okay. Thank you. Jose, you've, you are an entrepreneur, you've been an entrepreneur. You know, when you talk about your capital structure, it sounds so elegant and, and buttoned up, but I'm sure the process was hairy at best. Um, can you describe a little bit what that process was like and, and how it's been different from someone sitting in Guatemala to get funding from the different DFIs as well as the different private capital sources? Uh, yeah, so we were uh, making it up as we went along, basically, <laughs> because there was nothing here. This this was a this was pretty much a blank slate. Um, the, the the process, uh, and, and again, I think that the case of Kingo is is unique because uh, our our founders had a had a very strong personal network. Um, you know, and, and some early believers that 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 back the story, um, but we we discovered a a bit of a, um, a roadmap, if you will. Uh, first, getting sort of true believer local angel investors uh, who who would back the story, and that was step one. Then step two um, was to go to the uh, the IDB labs of the world uh, and and the Proparcos to get 
mainly convertible type instruments uh, that bridge the gap uh, and allow the company to get significant traction. Uh, so then they could raise a, you know, so, so we could raise a, a price round uh, institutionally. And, and then once, you know, once we had gone past the DFIs, uh, that's when we started raising um, sort of corporate VC money and, and sort of pure institutional money like C. So um, that that roadmap uh, has been replicated by by other by other startups in, in the Guatemalan ecosystem. But it's but it's not easy, obviously. You know, we, we it it the it's getting easier because I think the 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 world is is waking up to the to the Cuatro Grados Norte ecosystem. We have some success stories. We have a great story to tell, and some of the technologies that are coming out of here, we we are we believe are transformational. Um, so, so hopefully the next generations will have an easier time. And and what are some of the you know as you were going through working with the DFIs and even I mean in the case of the DFC we met over two years ago at this point right. So what are some of the things that the DFIs can how how can the DFIs improve their process for entrepreneurs? So I would say with the exception of of IDB Lab. Uh, most DFIs are not set up to work with startups. Uh, they're they're set up to work with the Banco Industriales uh, of this world, uh, with with big established uh, corporates, uh, and therefore things like uh, uh, you know how the funds are dispersed, uh, all the the reporting and ESG requirements, although you know very important, are in many cases very burdensome to to young startups. So. I think all the all the DFIs should start like like Banco Industrial did a, a sort of a, a startup department uh, and and really understand what our needs are and 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 how we think and the sort of the flexibility that that we need um, and that I think will go a long way to to really make the system a lot more or the the, the ecosystem a lot more dynamic. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, so Banco Industrial. You've been working with many entrepreneurs. You've got ambitious plans to expand not only within SMEs, but also micro lending. Um, and you mentioned strategic alliances with NGOs. Um, as we talked about earlier, uh, you've had the most experience in terms of volume of anyone else in Central America working with OPEC and then the DFC. Um, you know, in the report, uh, Connor's report, we learned that there's still a $14 billion financing gap for entrepreneurs in Guatemala. So what are some of the, what are the challenges that you see in their ability to get financing and, the, and, and as you try to roll out your plans and where might there be opportunities for a, a multilateral or the US government to step in and help close some of the gaps? Okay, and um, you know, uh, Christy, I, I totally concur with Jose in terms of uh, you know, and realizing that uh, it is hard for entrepreneurs to navigate the waters here in, in, in Central America and Guatemala to, to be able to, to successfully um, get financing. And, and, you know, the first thing that we have to, to accept is that, you know, the commercial banks have to you know, change their mindset and, and, and we all have to, to create the awareness of the importance of, uh, you know, supporting all of these new entrepreneurs coming into the, the economy and supporting SMEs, supporting the informal uh, participants in the economy, most of which are the micro businesses that we, that we have supported over the last 10 years. And, you know, there's a lot of things to be done. I'll get to that. But, uh, you know, th there's a, a couple of, of success stories that I think we can learn from and, and uh, you know, things that we've been able to do over the last 10, 15 years that we can replicate. Um, you know, for example, in, in micro lending is, was one of the cases. We built um, a portfolio of a little over a hundred million US dollars over the course of the last seven to ten years and, and, and this portfolio is comprised of over 30,000 and you know small credits granted to to different types of, of family-owned businesses that operate in the informal economy. How have we as a commercial bank been able to do that without getting in trouble with the superintendency of banks and whatnot? You know what we we developed with the help 
of a Chilean firm that was very strong in microfinancing, uh, we, we we learned the method from them and we basically, you know, started from the ground up uh, building a new credit process uh, that was specific to attend the needs of these uh, uh, of these micro businesses. And you know what? Uh, last year, back in April, May, I was really, really concerned about what, what was going to happen to this portfolio because you know we we had uh, you know the the economy was closing mobility was uh, was minimized and uh, businesses had to had to uh, operate you know at, at 40 30% capacity that sort of thing and i thought you know what this is going to be chaos for the micro uh, portion of our of our uh, loan book you know uh, 16 months later so today I can tell you that we did not only were able to grow that uh, portfolio, but also, you know, NPLs, 2.5%. I mean, these people, they just kept operating, they kept working. They, We, of course, had to react quickly. We refinanced, we restructured, we, and it was, you know, a, a very, very uh, laborious, uh, you know, task to, to take care of, but we were able to do it and we were able to do it successfully. Um, so that's one one I can tell you a, a success story that that I really like to to tell and and the other one and, and that goes a little more towards what what, what it is that we can do uh, you know looking into the future. You now Guatemala has a very large and very successful low income housing uh, guarantee scheme, uh, which is called FHA in Spanish, which is basically a. a, a partly government guaranteed scheme that allows banks to finance low income housing. And, you know, this has been in place for decades now and, and it has allowed banks to, you know, more aggressively get into uh, low income financing. And, and that's the sort of thing that when there's legislation in place and when there's a guarantee scheme in place that works, that definitely allows for not only not only banks to finance but also seed capital to come into the right places um, and I, I'm pretty sure that uh, there's a lot to be done for example uh, Jose that, that is here in Guatemala that uh, we, we Jose we still have a very large deficit of housing in in Guatemala but if it were not for FHA that would be even higher right so I guess uh, another example of, of legislation being able to bring about um, investment is energy, for example. Back in the late 90s, we approved a, uh, uh, an energy law uh, that, um, you know, uh, in, in, in 10 years time um, allowed for big players of the world to come into Guatemala to, to invest in energy generation. So I, I think that um, Aside from what we banks have to do, which I have to accept, we have to change our mindset. We have to, you know, be aware of the importance of actually supporting financially and with technical support and, and a lot of other things, financial education and, you know, financial inclusion, develop and, and improve our digital um, onboarding uh, processes, uh, our credit processes, our, our uh, account opening processes. And, and that is something that we're in the process of doing. But aside from that, I think that what we can uh, try to promote is some sort of a guarantee fund that, that you know, probably with, with the help of the Ministry of Economy and the uh, a couple of other agencies, government agencies, we should be able to try and put something in place that allows for that seed capital that Jose was mentioning uh, to, to come and support the development of these businesses and then have the, the banking industry, uh, hopefully Banco Industrial, <laughs> uh, supporting you know, with strategic alliances, with different players within the entrepreneurship ecosystem that provide technical capabilities and, and with the financing and with the market, um, you know, identification it should be able to come up with a successful business. I mean, uh, the Northern Triangle of Central America is has a strategic location to the biggest economy of the world. And, you know, with the USA uh, very, very focused on, you know, the near shoring and, and the, the near shoring necessity, not only of, of investments, but also supply 
uh, of certain different strategic uh, things that that you might need uh, this poses you know a significant opportunity for for our economies uh, and we need to do a lot of things to 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 try and take advantage of that successfully but uh, you know that the, in terms of guarantee schemes that we could come up with, you know, and, and, and banks changing the mindset, I think we could do do something really good. Thank you. Um, I just want to follow up on, you know, you talked about you, clearly you, you're making a ton of changes to be able to work with SMEs. Where is there an area where you just feel like there's an area that's that's just kind of a black spot that's never going to be able to be addressed by Banco Industrial and where there's a various opportunity for someone to step in and and provide support. Oh, interesting. You know, um, I, I, right now I don't I don't think I can tell you that I have uh, identified something that that we would say you know this we won't do. I, of course, we're more oriented towards lending rather than, you know, investing equity in, in these businesses. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, we we will be, we, I, I don't think we were, we're going to actively invest seed capital in these businesses. So that means that, uh, you know, these entrepreneurs have to, you know, be able to access that seed capital. And, and as Jose mentioned, Kingo's case is somewhat, uh, you know, uh, unique because, you know, the, the you know, the, the local network they had and, and and everything but not everybody has the scale the good business plan the 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 technical capabilities to to be able to to gather uh, that seed capital so i i guess providing access to seed capital is something that the commercial banking industry is not going to be very focused on doing so i guess if, if there were a place where, where I, I would say that somebody else has to step up and, and, and provide help, it would be seed capital. Okay, thank you. So then one last question for all of you and then we'll turn it over to the audience and get their Q&A. Um, so I think we've got a good sense on the on the financing side of where, where a lot of the gaps are. I guess two questions. First would be, what are some of the partnerships you know, because you, you've all touched on that a little bit, that, you know, that, that things need to be done in coordination. Are there certain partnerships that the DFC or other USAID um, or other U.S. agencies should be thinking about to help with the financing? And then the second is the other thing that really jumped out, um, I think, when you read the report from Connor, is that, you know, when you look at the, the and let's not get into the, the, the list itself, but the World Bank doing business report, when you look at where these countries fare, you know, how far down they are on the spectrum, how should the U.S. government and the Biden administration think about trying to address some of those challenges, assuming that we get a report in the first place? But um, how do they how do they go about addressing some of those so that investment is is easier? And I throw it out to all of you. Uh, I, I could start. Um, as you mentioned, I think partnerships um, are key to develop the, the entrepreneurial ecosystems, working um, with um, different kind of investors, family office, to be able to generate those venture capital funds that we will be able to provide the seed funding and the Series A, Series B funding for this kind of a startup is, is key. We have been working on that, um, working with other institutions that support entrepreneurs in developing the skills needed in the entrepreneurial ecosystems is key also. Um, we have been working with technical corporations in that regard, as well as having the instrument to support directly the startups to create that role model playing for other institutional players from outside the region to actually showing us in the effort to support these entrepreneurs is key. And that's where I'm seeing uh, most of the opportunities in the future. Keep working with the UCIA as well as DFC supporting this kind of um, startups would be a fantastic um, starting starting point, and we will keep the conversation um, going in that regards. Uh, if I may go next, um, so DFC and, and USAID are key. Um, obviously, we as 
we're at the center right now of U.S. foreign policy and, and the migration problems are real. But really, nobody wants to migrate. I, I think the solution to that is SMEs, SME um, growth uh, to create opportunities locally. So we have entrepreneurs and, and we have fund managers that are that are willing and interesting, interested in backing these SMEs. So the key is that DFC and USAID have to take a leadership role in actually being the catalyst to this capital formation. And right now, we've I think to date, we've had a bit of a chicken and egg uh, process where I think the DFIs are looking for the local market to lead and that won't happen. Uh, there is no culture of investing in private equity VC for the local market. So ultimately, I think the, the, the DFC and USAID in partnership with fund managers, you know, and I'll, I'll, I'll put in a, you know, a word for CIF, but fund managers like CIF who are interested in this part of the world, um, we have to lead the way. And that's, that will then attract the local capital. And even then, it's, you know, we need to create de-risking mechanisms because there isn't the culture. Uh, to invest in, uh, to take that risk position. So, so it has to be a strategy. And and again, I think DFC and USAID are are, are key in all of this. So, hey, I'll I'll take the question. Uh, I I concur with what the Magdalena and Jose has ha, have just mentioned. And and you know, having DFC and USAID as as market makers, if you will for this, I, I think would be a, a great catalyst. As I mentioned, I, I think that the Northern Triangle has a, a strategic location that provides it access to the, the biggest market in the world. However, we do have, uh, we're lacking a lot of other things, right? The infrastructure for one, uh, as well as, um, you know, I guess a little more, uh, you know, security in the, the, the part of the legal system and how that everything works around here. So I guess uh, investment in infrastructure is something that would definitely improve uh, the region's competitiveness. Uh, and in the case of Guatemala, there's a there's a project, there's a bill in, in, in Congress that has been sitting there for some time now that if passed, it could potentially benefit the investment in infrastructure that this country needs to uh, improve its capacities in terms of ports, airports, uh, roads in general. So, so I think there, there's a, a lot of things that we have to do locally uh, um, and, and we definitely should not uh, and cannot as a country depend on what, you know, a multilateral financial institutions or the U.S. government, uh, you know, a, a, is um, willing to help us out. In, in developing certain capabilities, but it would definitely help if DFC, uh, uh, you know, were to were to create a plan to to try and help us develop this culture of uh, you know investment that, uh, as Jose mentioned, we we are currently lacking. Okay. Thank you. So I just want to pay attention to the time. We've got eight minutes remaining. We have a bunch of questions coming in. So I'm going to pose the questions and then I think if one or two of you could could take them uh, and then we'll move on. Okay, so the first question, um, do you think that our fragile democracy, and this comes from Mauricio Villeda from GUFA Law, do you think that our fragile democracies and poor political leadership will have a direct investment a direct impact in potential U.S. investment in our region. I'll, I'll take I'll take it first. Um, I mean, it, it doesn't help obviously, but it hasn't stopped us. Uh, we've been able to do things uh, with very little and have huge impact. So, um, you know, we we're here. We're growing. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, it's there. It's something we have to deal with, but it's it's not stopping us. Okay. And a, a related, a similar question from Mary Speck, um, who's a former CSIS affiliate. Um, are corruption risks a major consideration for foreign investors? How do U.S. measures, such as the Engel List, affect the investment climate in Central America? I, 
I believe that probably all of our institutions actually do compliance check like before the, the different um, investments. Um, honestly, we have found amazing companies. We just invested directly in a company from El Salvador, Hugo. We are in due diligence with several projects in Guatemala as well. So I, what Jose was saying, I think is the identifying and knowing the culture and entrepreneurs are still um, throwing in, in the region. It's a matter of like identifying like how to help these different startups in particular. Thank you. And if I just, if I may compliment. So we as a startup that raises international institutional capital, we we have some KYC procedures sort of baked into the uh, to the shareholders agreements and, and the like. So any any significant contract uh, over a hundred thousand, um, you know, we need to run a KYC. Any any investment uh, from a new you know new party, we have to run a KYC. And, and and all of this is obviously you know understanding that that international institutional investors are concerned about you know who 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 we might deal with in Guatemala. So so all all these are things that you can that you can work around, they can structure around. Right. Thank you. Then, oh, sorry, please, Alejandro. <laughs> Thank you. If I may just add one comment. I mean, we, we got we have to be aware that um, if, if we want to create the sustainable economic growth in the region, talking about Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador, we need to attract more investment, uh, be it private, public, local or foreign. Right. Uh, that's the only way to get out of uh, out of poverty so uh, definitely as as uh, jose has already commented uh, i mean we are aware that uh, corruption does not benefit at all um, and we we need to to have stronger institutions we need to have uh, you know be able to convince uh, foreign investors that uh, there is a rule of law that works in guatemala uh, and, and i think it's it, it's hard i mean it's uh, we, that's something that you have to to build uh, day by day, right? So I, I guess um, there's a lot of things to be to be done. But uh, you know, usually when a foreign investor comes to a country, they they look for a local partner, and uh, I think they will find very strong, very formal, very um, you know professional local partners that are willing to participate with them in different types of investments. Thank you. Okay, last two questions. First one, what are, this comes from Henry Zimmer, who's with CSIS. What are the key emerging sectors in Central America where not enough investment or interest is going towards right now? How can the development community encourage investment in these industries from donor organizations and countries which might not even know they exist or are significant? If I may start, I mean, it's really all of the above. I mean, there's huge underinvestment in everything. So uh, so all the sectors that we mentioned in the beginning, health, education, financial access, all, all of those need investment. And, uh, you know, sort of regular low tech SMEs that are selling widgets, they need investment. OK. Anyone else? Or, I, I wanted to let Magdalena go ahead. Uh, but <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, aligned with Jose, we have been looking for opportunities in ag tech, agriculture, technology, health tech, ed tech, worker tech, financial inclusion, and what we call um, essential infrastructure services, that is mobility, connectivity, access, um, water, energy. Um, so therefore, we are we are open to different opportunities. These are the, the verticals that we believe are some of the key to actually um, start working on. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of opportunities in, you know, among different industry sectors. And as, as we've mentioned, education, health, yeah, there's a lot of things that we need. Um, Infrastructure, I, I insist, I think is something that will definitely improve the competitiveness uh, of the countries of the Northern Triangle of Central America. So I think that is some one of the big opportunities is 
investments in different types of in infrastructure in the region as, as soon as we can start with that. Okay. All right, we've got two minutes left. One last question specifically for Magdalena from Gary King, the president of Alpha World Group I, uh, from Alpha World Group Inc. What is the IDB doing with microfinancing and cooperatives? So we are actually in the design of a couple of like funds, microfinance funds, debt funds for this kind of um, public in particular, this kind of target in particular. We have a long track record of um, working with um, SMEs and SMEs target like farmers in particularly. We are going to keep working on this regard and we are under design with two um, initiatives in that regard. Thank you. All right, with that, we will end on time. I want to say a huge thank you to all of our panelists for your excellent feedback. Thank you so much to Pierre and Heifer for sponsoring this event. Thank you to Connor for the report. Thank you to Dan and the team at CSIS for, for putting this together. And, and I'm grateful to have served as your moderator. Um, wish you all a very productive and successful week. Thank you.